I'm Rocio Titunic from Princeton University. Matthias and I are going to jointly talk to you about regression discontinuity designs. I'm going to be doing uh, the first part and Matthias is going to take over the second part and we're going to have uh, 10 minutes uh, in between. Um, we are going to continue the causal inference and program evaluation framework. And so we're going to be thinking about a framework where our goal is to learn about treatment effect. Uh, uh, so basically the effect of a treatment or a policy or an intervention. And as we know, if the treatment uh, is randomly assigned, then it's going to be relatively easy uh, to estimate effects, although there can be complications, but in at least straightforward how to proceed. But if the treatment is not randomly assigned, then we're in the world of observational studies and we need to invoke some sort of assumption like selection observables, instrumental variables assumptions, some other assumption. The, the feature that all these assumptions will have in common is that they're not going to be, um, they're not going to be known to be true. They're not, going to, they're not going to be true by construction. They're going to be uh, held as assumptions and we're gonna hope that they're true and we're gonna do more than that. We're gonna to try to provide some evidence that is consistent with their being true. Uh, but it's always a complicated, but it's always, you know, a complicated problem and, you know, how credible are, uh, you know, our estimates and our conclusions based on observational studies. So the regression continuity design is one observational study, is one type of observational study that shares some of the limitations that are, you know, inherent to observational studies, um, but has some advantages relative to other observational studies. And the first one is that it's based on a simple assignment rule and this rule is based on external factors and this creates an objective basis to evaluate the assumptions that we're making uh, and this objective uh, kind of grounding in, in, you know, in reality and in some like actual, uh, you know, rules that are, that are verifiable allow us to falsify uh, the design in a way that other designs uh, can't be falsified and so this incre increases the credibility of our designs. They're also easy to interpret and of course they have some uh, peculiar uh, uh, characteristics and some limitations and one in particular is that the parameter that that uh, we can uh, uh, study is, is, is very local and we're going to see uh, what that means. So what is a regressions continuity design is defined by a triplet of a score, a treatment and a cutoff. So the units in the study receive a score and I'm going to call that score um, X and the treatment is going to be assigned based on the score according to a rule. And without loss of generality, we're going to assume that the treatment is given to units whose score is greater than the cutoff, and the treatment is withheld from units whose scores are below the cutoff. And when I withhold the treatment, I'm gonna call that control. Um, and so, you know, if you plot the score uh, on the x-axis and you plot the, you know, probability, the conditional probability of being assigned to the treatment or their control as a function of the score, you're going to see that it's zero for all values of the score that are below the cutoff and it's one for all the values that are above. And so there's a discontinuous jump in the probability of being assigned to treatment uh, from zero to one in all RD designs so there's, you know, abruptly, I go from having a probability zero of being assigned to the, to the treatment to a probability of one. And so the regression is going to be designed is basically a design that is based on this type of discontinuous assignment to treatment. And what we're going to do is we're going to place assumptions on top of this assignment rule so that the abrupt change in this probability of treatment assignment will, uh, will use that abrupt change as the basis to learn about, uh, about the treatment effect. So there's many aspects of the regression discontinuity design that we can that we can talk about. We call it the regression discontinuity taxonomy. Uh, there are different frameworks, and what we call the frameworks or approaches are approaches for identification and interpretation analysis. So we can make continuity assumptions and extrapolate, or we can do local randomization assumptions. We're going to talk about this in detail. We can think about uh, uh, settings where the score is continuous versus where it has repeated values. Uh, there's also different kinds of settings in terms of whether compliance with the treatment is perfect or imperfect, and that distinguishes between sharp and fuzzy. Uh, there's also situations where we can have a multidimensional cutoff uh, variable, a multidimensional score variable. Uh, we can also think about uh, time as a running variable or dynamic treatments. And 
So those are going to define different settings that I'll discuss briefly and give you an overview here. Um, we can also think about different parameters of interest. So we are going to base most of our discussion in average uh, treatment effects of some sort, and we will discuss you know, different types of average effects. But like in any other you know, causal inference setting, we can think about uh, quantile effects or distributional effects, and we can think about uh, partial effects. We can also think about um, you know, heterogeneity by subgroups and subpopulations, and we can also kind of think about generalizing the parameter of interest and in talking about extrapolation, which we, if we will have time, uh, we'll discuss later. So what I will do is I will give um, a little bit of an overview about you know, the general frameworks, and I'll talk a little bit about different kinds of settings to give you a flavor of what different kinds of regression discontinuity setups uh, you can encounter. Um, the regression discontinuity is not something that you design typically, it's something that you come across. And so to give you an overview of the different types of designs that you might come across might give you an idea of, you know, when can I apply these tools with different kinds of contexts. Uh, and then uh, in the final part of my uh, presentation, I'll talk about local randomization methods and Matthias will take it from there. Um, so let me introduce a little bit of notation and I'm going to introduce a notation uh, in the context of a randomized control trial or RCT uh, because uh, we're going to be discussing the differences between RCTs and regression discontinuities in, in, you know, in the next hour or two. So um, similar to Alberto, the notation is going to slightly uh, change. So Alberto had YN, I am going to have Y0, but we're going to adopt the potential outcome framework. So we have potential outcome under control, Y0, we have the potential outcome under treatment, and we have X in an RCT, you can think of X as being any covariate in the RD design, that's going to be the, you know, the score. I'm going to index units from, uh, by I from 1 through N, and the treatment is going to be T, and it's going to be a binary treatment for the rest of our presentation. And in an RCT, you know, as we know, by virtue of uh, the treatment being randomly assigned, the treatment is going to be independent of the potential outcomes, also of any pretreatment covariates. And you know, the, the observed that we're going to have an observed outcome, so the data that we observe is going to be the observed outcome, we're going to call it Y, and then data on T and X for all the units. And of course, we have the fundamental problem of causal inference that we only observe potential outcome under control if I give you the control, and we only observe potential outcome under treatment if I give you the treatment. And that is a fundamental problem, but in the case of an RCT, it's kind of, it has an easy solution, which is just go to the treatment group and you know, get the observed outcome in the treatment group, compare that to the observed outcome in the, in the control group. At least if we're, if we're talking about average treatment effect, it has an easy solution. We can just readily, readily identify the average treatment effect in the way that I'm, uh, I know everybody um, connected today knows. So that's, that's, you know, the setup of an RCT. I'm going to keep the notation and now I'm going to change the assignment. I'm going to go from an RCT to a regression discontinuity. And so what's going to happen is uh, if you have, you know, the independence of between T and the potential outcome is really going to be replaced by something that is, you know, has nothing to do with independence, which is basically an indicator that it's going to be uh, one whenever our score uh, is above a known cutoff that's going to be fixed and zero otherwise. The data is the same data as we had before. I'm now using X is going to be the RD score. And we still have the fundamental problem of causal inference, but we don't have the easy solution anymore because we don't have independence between the treatment and the potential, uh, and the potential outcomes. And so now the question is, what, uh, what are we going to do to try to identify uh, you know, some kind of average treatment effects and what can we do? And so we're going to talk about two different... Um, so so the, the first thing to note is that... Um, there's no identif identifying assumption that holds by construction. So this, uh, this continuous rule for the, for the assignment of the treatment doesn't imply, but it doesn't imply uh, in any way um, the identification assumptions that we need. And so we need to place those assumptions on top of the assignment rule. Uh, and so it's, um, it's apt, you know, we, we have different choices of what assumptions we want to impose. And then based on those assumptions, we'll be able to, you know, identify a treatment and go from there and think about estimation and so on. So we're going to talk about two kinds uh, of assumptions. Um, and those are going to be um, focusing on different types of effects. So we're going to def define um, in what we call the continuity based assumption, we're going to assume continuity of regression functions. And, we, and we're going to define the parameter of interest as the average treatment effect at the cutoff. So this is an average treatment effect at the cutoff. It's a little bit 
different from what you are used to seeing because we're not used to seeing of, uh, average streamer effects at a particular point. And so Matthias will talk about um, the, you know, the implications of that uh, for, for, for estimation and inference. Um, when we can also make different kinds of assumptions and instead of, you know, yeah, instead of uh, making continuity assumptions and focusing on the average treatment effect at a point, we could uh, define a parameter of interest that is the average treatment effect in some window or some interval around the cutoff. So it's not a point, but now an interval. And we can think what, about the average human effect in that interval. And that's what we're going to call the local randomization uh, based um, approach to the analysis. Both of these analyses, each one of, each one of these approaches is gonna make a different assumption uh, that is you know, gonna be placed on top of that discontinuous assignment rule. It's gonna have a different way of exploding, exploding the, uh, the the, the idea that, you know, above and below the cutoff, we're going to make some comparison. Um, and we're going to discuss both of them uh, in the next, uh, you know, hour and 50 minutes, hour and 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, local randomization. Matthias is going to come back and then he's going to uh, talk about continuity base. So when you think about continuity base, this is the canonical plot that you're going to see to represent um, this, um, this approach. So you're going to have the score, uh, in the x-axis, and then you're going to have the, you know, the potential outcomes on the y-axis, and you're going to plot in particular, you know, the, what we call, you know, the regression function, so the conditional expectation of the potential outcomes as a function of the score. And, um, and so basically, you're going to have the regression function on the treatment, the regression function on the control, and you're going to define the treatment of interest as that, you know, vertical distance between these two regression functions at the cutoff. And you're going to base you're going to base, of course, this is an unobservable effect, and you're going to base um, identification on continu uh, continuity assumptions about these functions. And Matthias will give you more um, details about this. So in the local randomization approach, we do something a little bit different, and I'll come back to talk about this um, uh, by the end of the presentation. Uh, we basically assume that um, there's some window um, so basically, we define the average treatment effect in this entire region here in this entire window, and we assume that in that window, basically, the, the, regression, uh, the regression functions are not going to be functions of the score, and that's going to allow us um, to, um, to estimate and recover treatment effects. So those are two different approaches. Um, we're going to cover those um, in the remainder. Uh, I'm going to cover local randomization. Matthias will cover continuity based. But, but before I go into the details of the local randomization approach, I, we wanted to give you an idea of this taxonomy that I was talking about. What are the different uh, aspects of regression discontinuity that you might encounter along these different dimensions? Um, and so we'll give you um, we'll give you some of them here, and then uh, uh, we'll talk about you know resources that we'll share with you. Um, we have created a GitHub um, site where you can you know, download uh, the materials for today and we'll also share references um, and resources. So one distinction that is very important uh, when you encounter regressions continuity design is whether you have perfect compliance with the treatment or imperfect compliance with the treatment. So here uh, on the left, I have what I call a sharp, what we call a sharp RD design, you know, the literature calls sharp RD designs. Where this is basically a design where uh, there's perfect uh, compliance. So everybody, uh, everybody with scores above the cutoff is, is assigned to the treatment. That's always the case, but also receives the treatment. So now we are looking here at the conditional probability of receiving the treatment, not being assigned to the treatment, but the conditional probability of receiving the treatment as a function of the score. And when you have perfect compliance in a sharp RD design, the probability of receiving the treatment above the cutoff is one and the probability of receiving it below the cutoff is zero. And so there's a full jump from zero to one in the probability of receiving treatment. When we have non-compliance, that jump still exists. So it's still the case that when you cross the cutoff, the probability of receiving treatment changes discontinuously, but that is not necessarily a change between zero and one. So in this particular plot here, you're seeing a one-sided compliance. So the Everybody uh, whose, uh, whose score is below the cutoff is in the control condition, doesn't receive the treatment, but above the cutoff, there's a fraction of the treated people, um, the treated units that don't take the treatment. And that's why you see the jump in the probability 
uh, be bus smaller than, than one. So it jumps from zero to something that's smaller than one. So this is typically what you'll see in a fussy RD design, which is a jump in the disc uh, discontinuous jump in the probability of receiving treatment, but it's smaller than, than one. And we can still use the ideas um, of the regression discontinuity. Typically, you know, if you are using a continuity-based approach, you're going to define a, a you know, parameter that's going to, you know, it's going to be a little different from the sharp parameter, and it's going to take this ratio, uh, um, this ratio uh, form that is going to be, you know, an, sort of has going to have uh, an analogy with instrumental, but like two-stage least squares or instrumental variables type of estimates that you might be familiar with, where you'll have uh, an intention to treat effect divided by your first stage effect. Uh, and that's uh, going to be a canonical estimate that we can define in both frameworks. So you're, again, like, um, like uh, it happens in, in you know, say the instrumental variable framework, you're gonna have to bring some additional assumptions to um, say exclusion restrictions or um, local, uh, local independence assumptions to interpret. But this is one distinction uh, that we might encounter uh, in practice and fuzzy RD designs are, are very, very common. The other kind of regression related design that you might uh, that you might encounter and this is common in economics in particular is uh, what uh, are called kink designs so these are uh, situations where you have a treatment or a policy but the policy is not uh, binary it's a continuous it's a continuous policy that depends on a score vi formula and the formula introduces kinks so it could be for example a piecewise linear rule uh, that a particular levels of income changes uh, the rate at which you have to pay taxes or particular levels of uh, you know, income changes, what kind of unemployment insurance uh, you can get. And so this rule introduces, um, introduces kinks. And so when you look at outcomes, so you might expect that the outcome, so the, the rate at which, the, at which um, the, the policy is operating is changing at this kink point. And when you look at outcomes, you might not, you're not gonna expect a jump in the outcome like in the typical RD, but you might expect a kink, like a change in the slope right at the cutoff, which basically is equivalent to a jump in the first derivatives of the regression functions. And so you can define parameters of interest that are kind of analogous. You can define, you can define them analogously and identify them with similar assumptions to the usual parameters, but you're going to have, um, instead of the, you know, the, the levels of the regression functions, you're gonna have the first derivatives. And, and when you think about kink designs, you can, you know, you can, they can be sharp in with, you know, perfect compliance, or they can be fuzzy with imperfect compliance. And you can also think about them in terms of continuity based or local randomization based. So a lot of these taxonomy um, dimensions are cross cutting. So you can have, you know, local randomization fuzzy or local randomization sharp, you can have, you, know, you can have a lot of intersections between these different categories. Oh, all right. So another um, another design that is you know our uh, you know type of RD design that is very common uh, and that you might encounter in practice is an RD design where we have uh, you know uh, a, either a score or a cutoff that is 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 not one dimensional but is multi dimensional. So here on the left, I have uh, what you know uh, we call the multi cutoff RD design. So we might have a regression discontinuity rule. Um, that uses some cutoff for some population uh, and then for some other population uses some other cutoff. And so really what you have is regression functions for one population and regression functions for another population. You have, you know, if you go cutoff by cutoff, you have, you know, two different, um, two different treatment effects, right? So imagine that I have two cutoffs here, then I have the usual RD parameter, but now I have, you know, one uh, RD effect for cut of one, another RD effect for cut of two. Um, so this makes it also opens the door to, you know, you can, first of all, very easily look at heterogeneity of treatment effects across cutoffs, but then it opens the door to think about what, uh, you know, oh, what would have happened, you know, what would have been the effect, you know, let's say this population is exposed to this cutoff and this is the effect, what would have been the effect for the same population uh, at, the, at the higher cutoff? And so this introduces some ideas about extrapolation, because my, as we'll talk about um, later, and, and Matthias will also emphasize when he talks about uh, continuity-based 
uh, a lot of these methods will be, you know, a lot of these regression scalability designs will be focused on very, very local effects. And so the idea of, you know, what's going to happen, what happens to this effect as I go away from the cutoff is going to be an important question that, you know, we're constantly looking for ways to try to answer that question. Once we have answered what's the effect at the cutoff or what's the effect in this very small window around the cutoff, we do want to know, you know, what's the effect beyond that. Uh, and for that, we're going to need to make, you know, ex uh, external other assumptions uh, and multiple cutoffs is one way in which we can, we can get at that. Another way in which we can have a multidimensional RD is when in, uh, we have a score that is multidimensional. So for example, when I have a language uh, exam and a mathematics exam, and then I'm gonna you know, place uh, children in a particular program when they uh, score above a cutoff in each, um, in, in, in each uh, score. And so basically what that creates is um, it's an entire boundary instead of you know, an entire boundary of, uh, of points, an entire boundary where the, where the, where the treatment is changing. Uh, from when, when the status is changing from controlled to treated. And again, so basically we're going to have uh, an infinite number of parameters that we could estimate along this boundary. But, you know, in practice what's you know, typically going to happen is that you're going to choose several points along that boundary and you're going to try to estimate um, the effect there. Um, and again, you, you know, you can basically define, you know, define and generalize uh, uh, the parameters and the approaches uh, for these different types of multidimensionality. Um, one, uh, important, uh, uh, one important case, particular case of a multidimensional, you know, two, two score RD, uh, RD design is a geographic one in particular, uh, that is, you know, it is commonly used uh, in, in, in a lot of areas of, you know, social science and economics in particular, where you can think of the score, uh, you know, units in space, and, and each unit having a latitude and longitude score. So, you know, two scores that determines the location and then having a boundary uh, that separates a treated area from a control area. So a treatment that changes this continuously at the boundary. Uh, and then you can think about estimating different treatment effects along the boundary. And so basically you can think that if you stop, you know, if you stop and you focus on that particular point of the boundary, then at this point in the boundary, uh, you know, you can calculate the distance of all of these units to this point, say the geographic distance of all of these points, to, uh, all of these units to that point, and then you can estimate a unit dimensional RD uh, effect at that particular point. You can repeat that for as many points as you want. And so um, basically it comes down to all kinds of, you know, there are different kinds of RD designs, uh, but they're all share if, you know, they all share kind of the same basic structure. First of all, they all share the fact that obviously there's a discontinuous uh, change in the probability of receiving treatment at a particular cutoff. This cutoff might be one, might be, you know, by more than one, might be multidimensional. The score might be single dimensional, multidimensional, but there's always going to be this formula that creates this jump in the probability. Uh, of receiving treatment, or at least you know, a, a kink uh, in, in a more general rule. Um, the causal effect that we're going to be able to you know, identify uh, for, with this design is going to be different in general from an RCT, and I'm going uh, to discuss that more. Um, all of these RD designs, regardless, regardless, are going to be based on this idea of exploiting this variation, this like abrupt change uh, near the cutoff, and we're going to be introducing some assumptions that are going to basically give us some sense of comparability. That if I go to units just above uh, the cutoff and I go to units just below the cutoff, in some sense, those units will be comparable or we're going to be able to use them to approximate and get at something that might be comparable. Um, there is no overlap, right? So meaning that every unit that is treated, if you think, if you think about a sharp, right, uh, think about perfect compliance, every unit that is treated uh, has a value of the score that is higher by definition than every unit that is controlled. And this is a, a, it's a lack of, um, there's a lack of overlap in this very important covariate. Typically our designs are given based on covariates that are very important. And I'll give you an example very soon. 
And so this lack of common support, in, it's, it's going to basically imply that treaty units and control units are going to be different by construction. And so we're going to need, you know, something to uh, basically we're going to localize and go close to the cutoff to try to, you know, regain comparability of some sort. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about how, you know, how to analyze them graphically. And, and this is going to convey a lot of information about the design. And, and then another takeaway will be falsification and validation methods that Matthias will discuss later. So let me talk a little bit about uh, how to visualize the design. And for this, I'm going to use uh, software. So here is the information of where to get our um, where to access our software packages. So we have already pack we have packages for RD estimation, uh, visualization, and inference in Python's data on R. And you can uh, have the GitHub page over there. You can uh, get um, the multiple. Um, you can download them and install them in your preferred platform. Um, and I'm going to use them to. I'm going to use now a little bit of those uh, packages to illustrate how to how to use. Uh, how to use them to analyze a real design. So the application that we are uh, going to analyze and Matthias will, will also analyze later. So I'll just introduce it once and then we'll come back to it at uh, various points. It's uh, an application published in the QJE in 2007 by Ludwig and Miller. Um, the question is uh, to study the impact of uh, giving municipalities assistance for, uh, for the rollout of Head Start and to look at that assistance uh, on uh, infant mortality in municipalities. Um, so the unit of analysis is municipalities in the US. Uh, the treatment is whether uh, the municipality received assistance uh, to, um, to roll out Head Start. And the, the score is uh, a poverty index. So important, you know, the, the the poverty index that they use is um, poverty index before, so this is happening in the in in the 70s. So they use the poverty index of 19, according to the census of 1960, to the to rank uh, municipalities according to um, most uh, most poor to least poor. And so this is important, right? Because it gives you an idea of uh, why regression discontinuities are, in a way, the opposite. You know, in one sense, the opposite of randomized controlled trials. Because in this case, we order municipalities from uh, most poor to least poor, and then we, and then basically the way they did it is because of budget considerations, they could give assistance to 300 municipalities. So they counted, you know, started with the poorest municipality until the 300 poorest municipality, and that's and and where the poverty index of that number 300 was the cutoff, uh, and so that determined the cutoff to be you know, that particular number, which means that basically you're now sorted, you sorted all the municipalities by poverty and all the poorest municipalities are in the treatment group and the control group. So basically this lack of common support is a lack of common support in the poverty index that is going to be uh, highly correlated with the outcome of interest, which is child mortality. Uh, so mortality of health, uh, of causes that might be affected by Head Start in children five to nine years of age. So you can see how um, this, you know, immediately creates a problem of comparability between treated and, uh, and controls. So I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to visualize this, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about how to visualize the design and I'm going to show you an RD plot. Uh, I will just, um, just show you a very quick little bit of code. Um, we have uh, shared this uh, data set and the code with you. Uh, in our GitHub uh, page, you'll find it in the MBR um, in the MBR uh, link, uh, and you can download it. Uh, either run it now uh, with me, or you can download it uh, later and, and replicate it yourself. So I just have the outcome, and um, I have the score, and then we have uh, several covariates that for now I'm not going to use, and I'm going to create a treatment indicator. So the only command that I'm going to focus on here is I'm going to use the command rd plot, which is going to plot uh, the outcome as a function of the score, uh, giving the particular value of the cutoff and with a few options uh, that I'll talk about. This is actually the default and in the default, you can actually remove even that 
uh, and that's going to be the default. And so this is what a regression discontinuity, you know, either what RD plot looks like. Um, uh, we have, you know, the outcome on the the outcome on the y-axis, the score on the x-axis, we have the cutoff and we can see there's, there's, there's a jump at the cutoff. So the, the RD plot is built with two ingredients. One, uh, the lines that you see here, those are global polynomials. So separately fitted to the right and to the left. In particular, the default is a, in, in this uh, command RD plot, it's a, a fourth order polynomial fitted of, you know, of y on x and on, on each side. Uh, you can see here that, and then you can, you can the points here are, um, so the lines are the fits from global polynomials, fourth order on either side. The points are, are uh, local means. So basically we split, uh, we split the support of the running variable into intervals. And for every small interval, we calculate the mean of the outcome. We plot that as a point. Um, the fit is, is fitted on the raw data, not on the point. Right, and so the idea is that the global fit will give you an idea of the overall shape of the regression functions, and the points will give you a better idea about the local variability around the functions. And, and what we are looking for is, well, if there was an effect of the treatment, the treatment is changing, you know, there, there is no head start assistance to the left, there's a system here to the right. Um, what we should see is, you know, if there was a treatment effect on the outcome, we should see a big jump. Now, what we see here is, well, it's a huge jump, right, uh, at the cutoff, but we need to be a little careful here because we, there, you know, there seems to be quite a bit of overfitting uh, going on. And so this is a problem that uh, the Matthias will talk about later when we use, so remember that we are trying to estimate what happens right at the cutoff. And so we're trying to estimate a treatment effect at the cutoff point. We're trying to approximate that regression function at a boundary point. Uh, there are no, there's no data to the left to estimate the, 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 this intercept here. There's no data to the right here to estimate that intercept. Boundary points have the feature that make global polynomials very unstable and lead to uh, overfeeding. And so if I run the same RD plot, but uh, but I, but I use a linear polynomial instead of a global. You can see the difference. These the 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 local means are not moving, right? What your brain is doing is all all that is moving is the global fit. So what your brain is doing is, in the first plot, your brain says the effect is huge. In the second plot, your 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 brain says the effect is moderate, and nothing has changed. All all has all that has changed is how we fitted the. Um, the global uh, the global regressions. So um, this is why you cannot use really an RD plot to formally estimate and in to formally analyze a regression discontinuity design because there's you know because there you know there's many possibilities for how you can present this plot. Nonetheless, it's a useful tool to visualize where the data points are, how much variability you have. Uh, in the treating the control group, uh, and and you know it's it's also kind of I'm setting up for Matthias to come back and and tell you why uh, we're going to um, be focusing on polynomials of lower order when when we when we use continuity based analysis and why we want to go local to the cutoff and how we're going to have to take care of the problem of you know of boundary bias and the fact that this is a boundary point. Um, all right. So for now, um, let me go back to the slides. Um, we have more um, we have more information to give you about how to particularly choose the bins, for example, uh, in an RD plot. And you know, um, just uh, invite all of you to consult the, the references in about optimal selection of, of of bins and the number of bins if you are interested. But in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving. Oh, Apologies, keep moving along. Uh, and I want to talk for the last uh, minutes that I have in my presentation, I want to talk about um, estimation and inference in particular. So basically up until now, I gave you a big overview of different kinds of issues and then, uh, and then how to, you know, how, uh, how to visualize an RD design. And now I want to get a little bit more formal in terms of how to proceed <clears throat> to um, you know, for how to estimate and how to perform statistical inference 
under, under different assumptions. So as I've been <clears throat> hinting from since the beginning, we're going to discuss two approaches. I'm not going to, I will discuss local randomization. Matthias will discuss continuity based. Um, there are, um, there are a lot of things that this, uh, that this approach is having in common. And so basically, um, we are going to need localization. So we're going to go close to the cutoff before we do anything else. And why? Because, you know, our assumptions are going to, are going to require, you know, unless we want to make very, very strong parametric assumptions, we're going to, you know, need to go close. Um, and so this will mean that we either need to select a window in the case of local randomization, or in the case of local continuity, we need to select the bandwidth. Then when we talk about point estimation, we're going to have um, a choice between, uh, you know, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, methods we're going to use um, for point estimation uh, and, and for inference. Uh, and for inference, we're going to, you know, have a, a focus on non-parametric and non-parametric methods. And in local randomization, we're going to have a choice between, uh, you know, fine sample uh, valid methods and large sample methods. Um, there are, um, so basically we're gonna focus on these two approaches. There are many others that exist, uh, empirical likelihood methods, derivation methods, et cetera. Um, those, are, um, those are not as widely used uh, in, in, in the social sciences and sometimes require, um, uh, you know, kind of ad hoc choice of tuning parameters, which is something that we will try to avoid. And we'll talk about how to do data driven and optimal choice as much as possible of any tuning parameters that are needed. And so we are not going to, you know, in general methods that require users to choose these tuning parameters by hand are going to lead to some, you know, problems in terms of replicability and, and so on. So, uh, but, but those exist and Matthias and I are writing a review article for the Annual Review of Economics and there we will, uh, pro you know, we provide comprehensive um, uh, sites in case you are interested. Okay, so I'll talk in the final part about the local randomization approach to RD design. What is the key assumption? So as I said, the the, tree, the regression discontinuity is defined by this discontinuous treatment assignment rule. That is the definition of it. But that's still not enough to be able to, you know, say, well, there's an average treatment effect here that's identified. I need something more. So in the local randomization approach, we impose uh, an additional assumption. And the assumption is basically informally, it says it's really the original assumption that, um, that um, uh, that was kind of the intuition behind the first RD paper in 1965, which is the assumption that, okay, if I go to a window around the cutoff, you know, a little positive number W, so I go C plus W, C minus W to a small window, then in there, there exists, such a window exists, and in that window, subjects are as if randomly assigned to, uh, to either side of the cutoff and therefore to the treatment. And so that is the intuitive assumption. So the intuitive assumption is there's, there exists a window near the cutoff where this behaves as a randomized control trial. Um, how to formalize that is, um, is actually requires a little bit of work. And so we're going to split that assumption into two. So the first is going to be that the joint probability distribution of the scores for units inside the window is going to be known. And that's what would happen in a randomized control trial if you assign uh, the value of the score randomly. You would know exactly the joint probability distribution of that score. So we're going to assume that it's known. In practice, you, you know, you, 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 you don't need yeah, you, you don't need to know it, but you might, you know, things like assuming that everybody has one half probability or whatever it is will imply that you know this joint distribution. So we're gonna assume that we know it. And then we also need to assume that inside that window, uh, the potential outcomes are not affected by the, by the score. So basically it's an exclusion restriction where the potential outcomes inside the window don't depend on the value of the, of the score. And so, this is a stronger assumption than you're going to see later um, that the standard assumption of continuity based. And um, if we make these two assumptions, 
Okay, so then we can say, well, then we have a sort of randomized control experiment in this window. Um, why is this uh, stronger than continuity? Because it, you know, given these assumptions, it's not only true that the regression functions are continuous at the cutoff, which is what you'll need for the, you know, the standard continuity-based approach, but they're also inside the window, they're completely unaffected by the running variable. Uh, and that's what allow us to treat this as, you know, an experiment. So if you think about the typical RD plot, so you have on, you know, this is the RD plot that I introduced before. So this is the typical, you know, uh, regression functions as a function of the score. Um, you know, if this is poverty and this is child mortality, you know, the potential outcomes are going to have, you know, a relationship that's going to be a slope. But if you think about what that similar plot would be in a randomized experiment, um, if, if you take the score to be, uh, you know, the, the random number that you use in your computer to assign people to treat it on control, and then you plotted the regression functions, so the, the regression functions, the potential outcomes, as a function of that, you know, pseudo uh, random number, you would see basically no relationship whatsoever between the regression functions and that number, because that number is just an arbitrary thing that you, it's an arbitrary device that is unrelated to the characteristics of the units. So the idea is, if we want to use the ideas of the, you know, of the analysis of experiments to analyze an RD design, we need to kind of put, put, put this, um, you know, this feature of a randomized experiment in, you know, as an assumption into the RD design. And so the way we do it is by basically localizing, as I was saying before, is of course, overall, we're not going to be able to assume that there is no relationship between potential outcomes and the score, because by definition, as I said, the RD score, if it's poverty, if it's, you know, and, and potential outcomes are, you know, outcome is mortality, those two things are going to be very strongly correlated. But what we're going to assume is that there is a window. Uh, it could be very, very small, right? Close enough to the cutoff such that if, I, if I'm able to get close enough, the relationship between the potential outcomes and the scores disappears. And so these regression functions are flat as they would be in an experiment. And in addition, you know, I know, or I can assume plausibly what is the distribution of that joint distribution of the score in, in, in that window. So um, for example, if I have, you know, if I, you know, if I have um, 100 units in that window and I have, you know, 60 and 40 in treated and control, and I assume a fixed margins randomization took place, which, you know, hypothetically, then I can, then I can use uh, that, that treatment, uh, that distribution uh, for, uh, for, for thinking about and analyzing this as, as an experiment. So basically, if you're willing to make those assumptions and we'll see, um, and we can validate this to some extent, then, then we, you can analyze if this assumption holds, then basically you can deploy all of the tools of the analysis of experiments that you already know to analyze a regression scoring new design. But, so there's two steps that, that, you, that we need for implementation. And the first one is we're going to need to, to select that window, right? We, we need to select that window. We can deploy all the analysis, all the tools from the analysis of experiments once we are in that window, but we need to know where that window is. And so the first step is to select it. And the second step is, well, given that window, we can use, you know, just perform estimation and inference. Uh, so the window selection step can be a, a challenge, although I will we'll show you a data-driven method to do it in a minute. Um, you know, but it is a you know, but in general, this you know, the 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 challenge of of using this this um, this approach is that the assumption of you know acid randomness, those two components, is is really it's it's going to be strong, and it's going to be a good approximation only if you really are able to go very near the cutoff, uh, and so that will that will probably lead you to uh, discard a lot of observations and you're going to end up with small sample and so that can introduce some that can introduce some um, challenges in terms of statistical power and, and so on so how to choose the window well you can do several things you can use co uh, pre treatment covariates which is our preferred method you could, you could or you could choose uh, you could find a, a neighborhood where the outcome and the score are independent uh, but doing some independence tests or uh, least preferred choice, uh, you can just uh, do it, uh, you know, just do it based on some substantive knowledge that you have in an ad hoc way. 
the preferred way is to use some sort of data driven method that allows you to validate and defend uh, and defend how you did it. Um, so the idea of the covariate, so the, the idea of using pretreatment covariates to choose the window is very simple. Is that if you have a covariate or more than one that is related, so here I'm plotting the regression function of the covariate as a function of the score. And this is again the cutoff and, and this is the true window where local randomization holds. Um, so imagine that you can find a covariate that is very related to the score overall, okay? But, you, but, but it's a pre-treatment covariate, okay? So you know there's no treatment effect because this is a pre-treatment covariate. So you know there's no jump at the cutoff, and you also know the covariate to, to be very correlated with the score. And so what you're going to do is, is, is then say, well, if there is a W where the local randomization holds, if I start with the largest W, with the largest window, and I do say a difference in means test. So I, I test in all hypotheses that the, that the average of the covariate, the mean of the covariate in the treatment group is different from the mean of the covariate in the control group in the largest possible window of the entire support. I'm going to reject that. Uh, I'm going to reject that null. And if I keep doing, you know, if I do it for a slightly smaller window, again, I'm going to reject the null that the, that the, the covariate distribution, the covariate means are the same. Uh, but there's going to be a point when I hit the window where local randomization works, when I'm going to stop rejecting that hypothesis, and then I'm going to re I'm going to stop rejecting it there, and I'm going to and then I'm going to fail to reject it in all the smaller windows contained in it, right? So this gives you a data-driven method of choosing the window uh, by basically choosing the largest window where you fail to reject. Uh, the know that the covariate distributions are the same in that window and in all windows that are contained in it. Uh, and I will show you in a moment um, how to implement that with the data. Once you found that window, then you can deploy, as I said, all the tools from the analysis of experiments. You have the three canonical choices uh, for, you know, Inman's and Rubin uh, book. So, you can do randomization inference Fisherian methods. So these methods are actually related to the methods Alberto was talking about, permutation methods uh, to use in the synthetic control um, design, where you will uh, permute, run, you know, that in, and regenerate different versions of the treatment, um, and then create uh, you know, randomization distributions under the null that way. So these methods are going to be finite sample exact uh, the advantage of this method is that if you have to do it in a very small window, they're going to still have um, known properties in this very finite sample. You can also use Neiman methods where the potential outcomes are fixed, but you rely on large samples, or you can uh, use the standard large sample methods based on random potential outcomes that are uh, large sample bounded. All of these methods will require a window selection and then a choice of the test statistic. If you're, if you're, if you're using Fisherian or Neiman inference, you're going to uh, need to think about um, the random, uh, the particular assignment mechanism as well. Um, let me go for the last bit back to the code, and I wanted to uh, show you if I can move this away. Yes, um, the RD plot that I just did uh, a few minutes ago was part of the RD robust. Um, library or command. Um, the uh, RD, the, the command that I will use now, which is the RD window win select is part of the RD log run. So basically we have separated the RD software by uh, RD log run and RD robust by continuity based methods and local randomization methods are completely separate intentionally kind of to uh, emphasize the fact that they're based on very, very different assumptions and very different conceptual understanding of the design in some sense. So what I will do here is I have in X uh, is the score and I have a number of covariates that I'm going to pass to this window selector. I, I also have the cutoff and I'm going to have a few um, parameters here. So I'm gonna run it. Um, I'm gonna run it uh, and while it's running, I will continue talking. So basically what this is going to do is going to implement a window selector. It's going to start, um, it's going to start from the smallest, um, from the smallest possible window. 
And we're going to impose a minimum of 10 observations on either side. Of course, the, one of the challenges of the window selector is that you have to, you have to ensure that the last window that you test doesn't have very, very few observations. Because of course, with one observation on either side, you're always going to fail to reject any hypothesis. You will have no statistical power. So, um, you know, one recommendation based on some power calculations that we've done is to use, you know, a minimum of 10 observations on either side. So you start with a minimum window in terms of, you know, 10 observations on either side. And then, also, which is this one, remember the, the, the cutoff is about 51.1. Uh, and, and then you start increasing the window symmetric, uh, symmetrically on either side. You can increase it by a step of length or you can increase it by number of observations. And you continue to perform balanced tests and then here we are doing balance tests for all the covariates and keeping the minimum p-value. And this is the covariate associated with a minimum p-value. And then basically what's going to happen is that, you know, uh, in cases where you can find a window where this works, you're going to find, um, you're going to find that the p-value starts being large. And as you make the window larger, the p-value is going to start to drop. Um, and it's going to start to drop until it, you know, it, it falls below, you know, conventional levels of significance. So if I show you in the slides, I run it for, uh, I run it for uh, many windows, which takes a little bit of time. So I didn't want to do it live. And what you see here is that this is a typical plot for the window selector. You have um, for small windows, and here's the length of the window. This is the length of the window that I'm plotting, and, and, and here's the minimum p-value uh, for each window. So for windows that are very small around the cutoff, so length you know, one or two, the minimum p-values are all very large, meaning that basically you cannot reject that the distribution of these covariates is the same. And then as you increase the size of the window, as you move to the right, the length of the window, those p-values start to decrease. They're not, not exactly monotonically, sometimes they go up and down, but you know, the, but there's a trend, right? That, you know, that, that, that it, as you increase the length of the window, this covariate balance gets worse and worse as you would expect because the outcome and the score are very correlated and, and this covariate is very correlated with the outcomes. And so basically what you're gonna do is, uh, in this case, this is the last window, right? This length right here, right, which is about, a little bit under five in terms of the you know the poverty rate the poverty index this is the last window where the p-value is about 0.15 the recommendation is to use a threshold for the p-value that is much higher than the conventional significance because we are flipping the null here right we are interested in 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 we're interested in, in the lack of effect not non effect so so that kind of changes the way you think about testing. And so you want that, PR, that uh, threshold to be higher. We recommend 0.15, but you know, as high as possible. So this is the last window where basically in this window and all the windows smaller than this one, right? All the p-values are all higher. Uh, and so there's no window here or in, on any sub window where you reject that null hypothesis. So basically that would say that this window is the chosen one. And so given that chosen window, which ends up being, it's around here. So you drop, see how you drop below um, 0.15 in this window. So we choose this one as, as, as the window. Now you can go to that window and use, uh, I'm gonna use an RD plot to give you an idea of the effect. So if I go to that selected window and I plot it, uh, what I basically, what the local randomization approach does is, after I've localized and I got very, very close, then I just do uh, a mean. I just calculate a constant polynomial, a mean on either side, and I can look at the effect and I can see an increase in, uh, in mortality that you can replicate with the command RD randinf, which will basically give you the difference in means uh, and give you the p-values from finite sample and large sample. Um, all right, 10.54. Okay, so I have one minute. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna do this, and I'm going to, this is where Matthias will uh, take over when we come back from break. Um, I'm not going to offer conclusions or big lessons because Matthias will be uh, doing that at the end of, uh, at the end of his part. Um, so I will kind of leave you hanging. We have a 10-minute break.
So we are going to be back at 11.05 Eastern uh, in exactly 10 minutes, I think. Yeah, because I just saw the minute go to 55. Uh, thank you and uh, we'll, see you, we'll see you in time.